We'll get to episode 262 in just a moment, but before we do, I'd like to ask for your support of I Can See You. Whenever you need to make a purchase at Amazon.com, please use my affiliate link by going to IcanTSeeYou.com slash Amazon. That'll take you directly to Amazon.com's homepage. Shop as you normally do. Check out as you normally do. It doesn't cost you anything more, and I may earn a small commission from your qualifying purchase. Again, that's IcanTSeeYou.com slash Amazon. Thank you so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. From Studio B in Swarthmore, this is the I Can't See You podcast with David. It's like blind people for dummies. Hello there, and welcome to episode 262 of I Can't See You. My name is David, at David Benge on all the socials. I'm really glad you're here for this episode, and welcome inside Studio B. I have a lot to talk about because it's been a minute since I last recorded. I had a very busy week to 10 days, and I've got a lot of things to talk about, but obviously I'm not going to be able to tell a lot of stories about them because there's just too many. I'll start off with this, though. Do you remember I was doing the raffle tickets? When, after I picked my tickets, Liz, for me to pick my tickets, I before we sold any tickets, I picked 20 out of the pile. They were in numerical order. And Liz turned them upside down, not to, <laughs> I don't know why, because I, you know, I couldn't see it. Liz turned them upside down and I picked, you know, from all, the whole spectrum of, you know, from one end to the other, I picked them out and we wrote them down and moved on. But as she looked at the ones that were still remaining, she noticed one and it was hard to read. And it was 069. She didn't want to use it. She didn't want it. She wanted to make sure we didn't sell it unless that was the last ticket we had because she thought no matter which way you looked at it, it was very difficult to determine what number was. And I don't, I, I'm not sure if the zero was printed a little funny. I'm not sure what the reasoning is there, but we didn't sell it. None of the tickets that I have sold and I sold 47 or 48 of them, not one has come out. I'm recording this on the 15th, so the month is half over. Not one winner, not me, not my friends, not listeners, not Liz's co-workers, no one has won. But you know what number did come out on the 3rd or so of April? Might have been the 4th, might have been the 2nd. Yep, 069 came out. And I ran upstairs when I saw when I saw the number, I'd run upstairs to tell Liz and she couldn't believe it. So that's kind of funny. And I, I'm thinking that's ominous. And maybe that's going to be the only one that would have come out. A couple of episodes ago, I talked about an article by Michael Schumann in The Atlantic. And I kind of railed on him about not being able to find the entrance to Duncan and the way he wanted to be treated by others, that even if they just saw him wandering around on the streets, he wanted them to, he wanted other people to help him, which is the exact wrong thing to say. Well, Brian and Ed talk about it on that real blind tech show. I'd emailed the article to Brian. They talked about it. They got into him a little bit further than I did. And it's a good listen. And I'm not just saying that because I'm also on that episode, but I didn't talk about that because I was on with Janine and Allison while Ed and Brian were at CSUN. We did some recaps of CSUN which is an assistive technology conference out in Anaheim while Brian and Ed were actually at the conference and they stayed a couple extra days. We recorded on a day that Brian was doing a, a stand-up set at the improv, a, a comedy club in LA. I don't remember which one it was a big one, but whatever it was, that's where, that's where he was the night I was recording with Janine and Allison. So Brian kind of mashed the two episodes together and so you'll hear me on some and, along with Allison and Janine, and then you'll hear Brian and Ed talk about CSUN and that article. As I mentioned, I've been super busy the last week or so. Most days I've had multiple events, whether it's meetings, had a financial meeting with the NFB of Pennsylvania, had a intermediate unit, Delaware County Intermediate Unit event. It's called a transition fair. 
which was right around the corner. So I helped with that. I helped Simon out. Simon kind of situ- got us situated there. And a transition fair, if I haven't explained it before, is when a kid, I'm sorry, when a student is going from middle to high school or from high school to college or high school to work or high school to a trade school or whatever, they need information and things like that. We were there as the Keystone chapter to show any blind kids, visually impaired kids, sorry, students, that we could help them if needed between the scholarship that's offered by the NFB of Pennsylvania or other help with resources and maybe they need some advocacy, things like that. There weren't too many blind or visually impaired students that came by, but there were other folks there that we were able to talk to and give some information to about both the Keystone chapter and the NFB of PA in general. And so we made some good connections there. We may get some opportunities to have some folks on White Canes Connect. We may get some opportunities to go and speak at certain events and things like that. So that's going to, that was all worthwhile. So it was a good thing to be at. That was, that was one of my days out. And I'll get to another one on Thursday. I had something and I'll get to the SEPTA advisory committee in a few minutes. So I've hinted at this for a couple of episodes and it it seems to be never ending. And it just, to me, I was going through some websites today. It just seems never ending. And I, I talked a couple of episodes about getting an email from Johnston and Murphy. They are the shoes that I typically wear. Now today I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, as you can see. So I've got sneakers on, which I love the new balance sneakers that I have on, not an issue, but I love the Johnston and Murphy Schuler bicycle shoes. I first bought a pair. Actually, I think I bought two pair back in 2006. And a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from Johnston and Murphy saying, congratulations on your anniversary or something like that. We're really glad you're here. It's been 17 years since you first made a purchase from us. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I didn't even make it online. I made it at the store in King of Prussia. And I thought, this is great. And you know what? My black Schuler bicycles, yeah, they're getting pretty beat because I wear them every day. In fact, I think I have a pair of brown ones that if I've worn I, at all, I've only worn them once or twice. So I need a new pair of black ones. And I thought, okay, well, here's this email. The email's not 100% accessible, but between voiceover on my phone and some of the things with the phone reading the images that are there, it worked out enough so I could kind of tell what was said. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to see if they're on sale. If these, and they usually run, I, I think they're $129, $119. I don't remember what the normal price is, but on occasion, you can get them for 99 bucks. And I thought, oh, if I can get them for 99 bucks, that would be great. I missed an opportunity around the holidays to get them for 99 bucks and to get a discount using my American Express, which wasn't a lot, but it was five or 6%. I don't remember what it was. That would have been great, but I missed that. Okay. So I double tap on the email to go to the website. I get to the website on my mobile, on my iPhone. None of it was accessible. Nothing. And I had hoped, and I will at some point, when I can catch my breath, I will go through the app and show you what it's like to go on the mobile to that website. I was so dumbfounded by the lack of accessibility of this site. And in fact, in the email, it said, if you need assistance because it's not accessible, call this number. Well, that's great to call that number. However, it was after hours when I was looking at the email. It was on a weekend. It was in the morning before those hours started. So I couldn't call. And so, of course, I didn't order the shoes. And I was I went from being so excited that they could go back and see that I had first made a purchase 17 years ago that, oh, you know what, now that I think about it, hold on one second, 17 years ago is 2007. Like I said, I bought my first pair in 2006. So they, the second pair I must have bought online, and that's where it came from. Whatever. Okay. So... I was so excited that they saw my first order, well, I guess online order now, that it was just completely taken away when I went to the site and I couldn't get anywhere. I couldn't get anywhere. 
And I don't remember exactly what it said, but it didn't say image. It had some other word. And it basically said, you know, keep away blind people is what it might have said. (laughs) Because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't see what the image was. It wouldn't tell me pricing, sizing, anything. It couldn't tell me any of that. And it was so frustrating. I just, I couldn't believe it. They went from something great to nothing, where I couldn't even place an order. Today, as I'm doing some things on my phone, when I'm upstairs with Ziggy during the day, I thought, oh, I'm going to go and take a look around on Idealista. That's one of the real estate sites in Europe. I reinstalled it because I had it, I, it had either been offloaded by me or by my phone because I hadn't used it in a while. And you can check properties in Spain and in Italy, maybe a few other places. It's weird in Europe, there is not an MLS like there is here in the US. So you can't go to one site and see everything and have every, see all the listings. So this site might have some things, that site might have some things. It's all dependent on the people who have listed the property. If they put it on Idealista, and it might be called Idealista, but it's ideal in ISTA basically. So I put it back on my phone and it says language or something like that. And then it says button, button, button. I don't know what those buttons do. And I was, I was just so frustrated because it wasn't the first thing I had gone to today. Somebody had told me about some property in New York City and I was curious to take a look at it. So I went into Zillow. Zillow also not accessible. More accessible than Idealista was. And just every time I click on something, whether it's a news article and there's all sorts of issues getting from getting through an ad, or if there's video ads, which a lot of websites use, there's a countdown, there's a hit pause, there's so much to get through. Sometimes you can't even get through an article. Or sometimes there's weird noises that you can't get through. So as you're listening to the article, you hear all these other things going on. This don't, 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 don't. And it is just so frustrating. But Johnston and Murphy, I was so disappointed. I was disappointed with Z- Zillow today. I, 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 <laughs> I tweeted something about it and I'm hoping to hear back and, and show them, Hey, look, here's, you know, what I can do and what I can't do. And it's not much that you can do. While we're on the can and can'ts, about a week ago, Lisa and I had a meeting with a guy named David Goldberg, and he said, do you know you're not saying the right name for your podcast and your website? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, you're not saying the T. He said, you're saying I can see you. And I said, no, no, it's called I can't see you. He said, yeah, that's what I said. I said, no, no, I said, I can't see you. He said, you're not saying the T or the T loud enough to sound like it's I can't see you. So if you notice today at the beginning, I kind of made it a little bit more pronounced. I can't see you. (laughs) Better, right? So we'll see. I'm going to, I'm scheduled to do a free class uh, at the beginning of May with Lisa and a few other folks and David. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But as far as Johnston and Murphy goes, just so disappointed. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I had a lot going on last week. And one of the things that I was really excited about was an Eclipse listening party on Monday. And I was really looking forward to getting together with everyone and hearing this device that Harvard University, I believe it's called a light sound device, and just to be part of the eclipse. In Philadelphia, it was only 88% coverage, but it was still cool because where we were was along the Delaware River. The Ben Franklin Bridge was behind me. I took a couple of blind selfies. The, the thumbnail was <laughs> was taken there in my funny shades, which I, I looked up maybe three or four times and I couldn't really tell what was going on. So it didn't really matter. But this device that was sent to Trish from Harvard 
was supposed to tell us, you know, when the eclipse was happening. And it had a very nice sound. It was almost a little creepy, kind of horror movie-ish. And you'll hear, I'm going to play a couple of clips in a minute. But I was underwhelmed. And I really felt bad because the folks who were totally blind, Simon and Katie, they really, really thought this was the coolest thing. And I just, I just thought it missed the mark. Now, what was cool was one of the guys there, his name is Owen. He actually had taken classes and I believe is certified to do audio description. So coming up in the clip, you'll hear him as well. His description is great. That was much better than this device. Basically, what the device did, as it gets darker, the notes get lower and gets lower and lower and lower. Now, it never got to the point where it got to what they call crickets, but it got pretty low. And again, the sound was all right, and you'll hear the sound in the video, but it just, our phones... If you have seeing AI on your phone and you put on the LiDAR, you can hear the same thing. The sound isn't as great as this device had, meaning the I, I think they used actual instruments to record the, the sounds. But it does the same thing. I sometimes mess with that with Ziggy when we're upstairs in the living room and we're in front of the windows on a cloudy day. I'll raise it up and then I'll cover the the camera, and then it gets really deep. Like, you know, you can almost play a song. If you put it on that, you just wave it around and just wave it. It makes all sorts of notes. And again, you could probably make a sound, a song. So that part of the, <laughs> the afternoon was disappointing. It was great to get together with everyone. It's a whole bunch of people that I like to be around and we do a lot of things. Uh, Trish and Andy were there. Simon, like I mentioned, was there. Lisa was there. Katie and Ryan. Owen and his wife, who I'd never met before. Uh, I met an, another guy who, whose name right now, Peter, who I'd never met before. I believe he works at Apple. And it was cool to be around everybody. And it was great to be right along the river. Now, it did get cool when the eclipse was at full swing. It was very cool literally cool. <laughs> and part of it was we're right there along the river and it was a windy day. It was a cloudy day for the most part. They would break in and out. The sun would break in and out from behind the clouds. So it was cool. Now, one of the things that I noticed, and I was talking to a friend, another NFB member who lives in Erie, where they were in the path of totality, she said the temperature dropped 13 degrees from the beginning to the peak. And the other thing that she noticed, and we also noticed this when we were uh, at our group listening, the birds, the birds got quiet. It was still, they weren't flying around. They weren't chirping, nothing. It was silent. And she noticed that as well. And I thought that was very interesting. Primarily, I guess, birds at night, once it gets dark, they go go to their, their nest and that's the end for the day. And it was just, that part also very cool. Somebody brought federal donuts, also very cool. I had one and a half of those. <laughs> so that part was great for all of that. It just wasn't the same as seeing the eclipse itself through those funky glasses on TV. It just isn't the same. And that's a lot of things when even with my limited sight, when I was even five years ago, when I had more sight, it's just not the same. I don't enjoy going to the sporting events as much. That's when I started going to concerts more because, you know, what do I need to see there? I just have to stand there and listen to the music. And uh, to me, it was disappointing. It was the, the device itself was disappointing. Here's some of the video from the Eclipse listening party. And again, especially listen to Owen because he really does a great job describing the eclipse. Yeah, listen how low that is. Yeah. It's almost going to be as far as we get as well. I think so. Hmm. Another example. So, okay. Is it covered because of the clouds? Yeah, it's a cloud. Yeah. Okay. A cloud. And well, probably well, both. So, and you know, both. Yeah. Looks. It's cloudy almost at night. Mm -hmm. So, it feels kind of to me like it's like a dust. Like yeah. Like <laughs> the air density. Hmm. It does feel different. It does like it's see like a, a brightness around. I mean, so it seems it's not like cloudy. It means it's cloudy right now. I mean, the, the, the brightness you're feeling is, is not brightening up now. No, no, see, no, no. I mean, just like at this way, oh, the brightness coming around like out in front of me. Yeah, like there's uh, what you're looking at. Well, what you're 
pointing to is yeah. there are breaks in the clouds in front of you. Oh, okay. But then literally behind to your right. Right. Oh, now you can see it, it just look out like it, it actually so looks like something yeah. out of like a scary movie. Oh, yeah, it's a little gotcha. sliver. Okay. Oh, wow. Like some like like it this one. way. Come. And they just see it through the clouds. So like even that. the glasses are yeah. uh, too dark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks like just the like the edge of a bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh huh. Like the one so side. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, I'm seeing yeah, it. Yeah. It's a perfect. It's like, yeah, the cloud is obstructed. Oh, here comes the sun. Oh, it's a bit of sun now. Oh, right. There it is. Wait. Yeah, it's all it's all dark and shadowy here, except for like that one really bright sliver of the sun. And is that bright sliver from like nine to noon? Where's the sliver? It's from like twelve to six. Twelve to six on the okay. left side. On the left side, okay. Actually, probably about twelve oh five. Phil. Oh three to <laughs> to thirty three. I'd say. <laughs> Again, being with everyone was great and talking and spending a couple of hours with these folks. It was just, that part was great. And then later in the week, I got to see most of them again because Simon was playing a uh, gig at a place called Dock Street Brewery South. And a whole bunch of us went. I, I want to say there was uh, 30 or 40 of us from both the NFB chapters in Philly and the Philly meetup group. It was just a lot of fun. And to listen to Simon sing and the way he goes through everything and talking to the crowd, just very good for, for someone his age. Like he's, and I know he's been doing it for a while. It was a lot of fun. It was just great to, again, great to be together with everyone and talk to everybody. That was a lot of fun. So I got to see everybody a couple times last week uh, from our groups. Before I went to Simon's thing on Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, I went to a SEPTA advisory committee meeting in Center City. I guess it's Center City. It was on 8th Street, 8th, whether it's Chinatown, Center City, whatever it was, it was 112 North 8th Street in Philadelphia. Not at SEPTA headquarters, at Liberty Resources, which is a disability organization that helps folks with disabilities with resources, hence the name. So there's me and around six or seven other blind folks. There's folks in wheelchairs and some deaf folks and things like that. You know who wasn't there? Somebody from SEPTA. They joined via Zoom. And what is ironic was that at one point he said, well, you know, it's usually fine that we're not there because we can communicate via video couple of minutes later, there's a lady asking and she's like, and, and the guy from SEPTA says, well, we'll have to talk, take this offline. And I said to a couple of people, well, you know, had you been here in person, the room was big. They could have gone to the back of the room and had the discussion right then and there. It is just unreal how SEPTA has pushed off disabled riders. They outsource that portion of their transportation to other companies. Those other companies are horrible. Last week, the day before the committee meeting, Stacy was stuck somewhere because they said, your ride's on the way, your ride's on the way. And then they said, we don't have a driver for you. Well, how could it be on the way? And then they don't have a driver. When she did get a driver, they went past her house to drop somebody else off and then had to come back to her house. It is, I just don't understand how they get away with this stuff because as I've mentioned a million times, time is your most valuable asset. You may think it's money, but when you spend a dollar, you have a chance of making another dollar. When you spend a minute, it's not coming back. It's over. It is done. You're not going to feel as great as that. That last minute was. It's over, and you only have a certain amount of those. And once they're gone, it's over. Everything's over. So the fact that they couldn't show up, and three people asked. The first person, Trina, said, you should be here. It's, it would be much easier to talk to you if you were here, and she had a couple of other things to say. They never addressed the fact that they weren't there. 
couple minutes later, another person asked, Kim said, why didn't you answer Trina's question? Because it just seems weird that you're not here. Why aren't you here? Still didn't answer. Finally, they called on me, the guy in the plaid shirt, because <laughs> Latoya, who knows everybody there, I believe that's her name. Maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I think it's Latoya, calls on me. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I said who I was, first vice president, NFB of Pennsylvania. And I flat out asked the guy, why aren't you here? We're right around the corner from the SEPTA headquarters. He could have walked over. He could have walked over. And the fact that they couldn't give the disabled riders who showed up, and again, not easy for the blind folks, not easy for the folks in the wheelchairs to get there, but they got there. And there was probably 20 or so people there. Those folks showed up, including myself. And I was there because Lynn couldn't go. The president of the NFB of Pennsylvania asked me to go because she had some other meeting to go to. I just don't understand, especially with the way things are today with rideshare. Why can't the blind folks use an app, whether it's Lyft, whether it's Uber, whether it's something else, to then, when you need a ride, you punch it in an app and 10 or 15 or 20 minutes later, somebody shows up to take you wherever you need to go. Why do you have to call the night before? Why do you have to be given this window that may or may not actually work? It's very unreliable. If you're going to a doctor's, they, they have a, and I don't know the actual breakdown of if you need to be picked up at eight o'clock, they can come a certain number of minutes before, they can come a certain number of minutes after, and they still count that as on time. And I don't remember if it's 20 minutes, a half an hour, I don't remember what it is. But either you have to tell them a little bit earlier so that you make sure you get to your appointment or more importantly, you get to your job because what's gonna happen if you keep showing up late to your job? You're not gonna have it. So I don't understand why, if they're outsourcing anyway, why can't they outsource it to Uber or Lyft? I mean, I know the answer because it's a money thing. They're either getting some sort of kickbacks from these other transportation companies that are doing the actual work, or these people are charging such little amount of money that it doesn't make sense to switch. Whatever it is, it is just asinine, just completely, totally wrong how the disabled riders, and I know it's not just here in Philadelphia. I talked to Ed when I was on an episode of That Real Blind Tech Show. We talked about it. It is just wrong how it's done. And there should be a better way. One of the things when I was there, I was sitting next to Eugenio and he said, are you going out to lunch with us? And I said, oh, I didn't know, but sure, I'll go. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to eat lunch here. I'm going to have to get a train home to take an eye drop because I have to take this eye drop every four hours. I never imagined I'd be doing anything after. I didn't know that Eugenio was going. And I honestly didn't think there would be that many people at the event that I would know. I knew Stacy was going and I was pretty sure Yvonne was going, but otherwise I didn't, I didn't think that there would be anybody else there that I knew. So it was nice to go out with everyone. We went to a place on uh, 101 North 11th Street. I forget the name of it. Bar Lee, I think it's called. It was a very cool place. And I had some fried rice, shrimp fried rice. Very good. But by the time I got done and then got on the train, I got home. I took a little nap. And then I had to go out again. To, and I had to take ride share for this because it wasn't anywhere near public transport that I could easily get to, to go to Simon's thing. So I was home for roughly 45 minutes once I got off the train to the time I got in the Uber or Lyft. I don't remember which I used, but it was a long day, but it was a that part of the day, again, the part with Simon and listening to him sing the different Sinatra tunes and, and things like that, it, it was all worthwhile. And going to the SEPTA meeting, even though they weren't there, was also good. Now, Stacy had asked me to go to... They're having one on Saturday, the 20th, because I'm going to Vegas next week, I have stuff scheduled so I couldn't go. And I tried to rearrange it, but I, it just wasn't going to work out. So I'm not going to that meeting. Now, this meeting is more they're changing some of their bus routes and stops and things like that. So not as crucial to me because I usually just take the regional rails. Occasionally, I'll you know, do a bus if I have to, when I went to Eastern State Penitentiary last fall, things like that. But most part, I'm taking 
some sort of rail, again, whether it's the regional rails or the Market Frankfurt line, things like that, or the 101 trolley. Before I go, I did want to mention episode 100 of White Canes Connect. We are really excited that we got to 100 a little faster than Lisa originally thought we would, and around what I thought. I was hoping that we could do one episode a week, just like I was doing one episode a week of this. Now, obviously, I'm not doing one episode per week of either of them because of the time I'm spending editing and the other things that I now have to do as well. But episode 100 on White Canes Connect, we had NFB president Mark Riccobono, and he talks about a bunch of different things, both the things about the NFB itself, his journey into the NFB, what got him in, and he talks about getting certified in sailing and all the things that that entailed. One of the things, which kind of sounds scary to me, you have to capsize the boat and then you have to get it back upright. It's got to be completely capsized and then you've you've got to do that, which again, sounds pretty scary, but obviously he was able to do it. We talk, he's a big baseball fan. We talk about baseball. He threw out opening pitches at both a Orioles game at Camden Yard and down in Houston last summer at the convention. One thing that I talked to him about was there are folks outside of the Federation that sometimes use the word militant when they talk about NFB members. And so I asked him about that. And he had a couple of stories to tell, uh, which were very interesting. <laughs> One of which he talked about a guy named Gary Wonder who stood in front of a rideshare car so he couldn't get away when they refused to allow one of his colleagues in who uses a guide dog. And this has been a big issue. I know my friend Brian has had trouble. And I guess Brian really hasn't had the trouble. Wes has had the trouble, <laughs> has had the trouble. But it reminded me, the story reminded me of that from back in, when was it, 1989, whenever Tiananmen Square was, where that guy stood in front of the tank. Kind of reminds me of that on a smaller scale. Uh, but he talks about that. He tells that story. It was just a great interview. It was very nice to speak to the national president. And we talked a little bit after I got some ideas on what to do as far as the CRM, which I may or may not have mentioned here, where... The NFB of Pennsylvania has been having an issue with what kind of CRM to use. What we were using isn't available anymore, and we're ju we've just been looking. We don't have anything yet, and we've got to get something because there's 8 million lists now of our database, and I make changes on the one I have, but then I forward it to somebody else, and maybe they don't make any changes, but then somebody else makes changes to it who also has it. But So all these different lists are around almost identical, but not quite. So we talked about that and what they use down there at NFBHQ. It was just a very nice talk that Lisa and I had with, again, NFB President Mark Riccobono. So that's episode 100. It's available on YouTube at PA Blind Podcast. It's available on Apple, Spotify, iHeart. It's available on Odyssey. Just about any place you can get a podcast, you can find it. Again, episode 100 of White Canes Connect, and it's a great milestone. And we're now to the point where we've went over, we've gone over 10,000 downloads much faster than this podcast went over 10,000 downloads. And at some point within the next year and a half or so, if all goes well, White Canes Connect will pass me as far as number of downloads. And I know it, it sounds weird to say that because obviously this is mine and mine alone. And that is White Canes Connect is one that is. Not just me. In fact, Lisa created it. She's the one that came up with the idea. She came up with the idea of an audio <laughs> of an MP3 file that would be on the website. And we got together and we figured out what we were going to do. But it, it's just, it's just incredible at how we're growing and we're actually trying to get a Jacob Balotin award. So we've been working on that. That's another thing that I've been working on this last week because we asked past guests to send in letters of recommendation. And then I had to upload them, and it's technically not uploading them. It's copying and pasting, which is a whole different story. But it's just been something that I've really enjoyed being a part of, and I hope we can continue. I wish we could bring in some more folks to lend a hand, or in this case, a voice, to do things. Simon has done some things on there. We've had a few other folks. Stacy's on it occasionally, Preston. And it's nice to have that where... It's not always Lisa and I doing 
the interviewing and getting the guests and everything like that. Because if we can have more folks doing it, then we can have more episodes. I will just have to edit them. And that's not a, I mean, sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it doesn't. So it's just been a very busy, like I said, week to 10 days. I am hoping to have this edited and out within the next day or two. We'll see how that goes. Ha ha ha. But for now, if you've got a question, a comment, a show idea, please reach out. You can reach me, as I mentioned, all the socials at David Benj on Twitter or X, whichever you prefer, Facebook, Instagram, what am I missing? LinkedIn, and on YouTube where you can listen to the podcast. You can always look at the podcast with the video and everything, me waving my hands in front of the camera like I am just now at I Can't See You. So youtube.com slash at I Can't See You. Want to get directly to me, please reach out. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. That'll get to me right away. Or better yet, give me a call 646 926 6350. You've got up to three minutes. Please leave your name and your town. If you do, leave a voicemail. Questions, comments, show ideas, something that I said today, maybe you have an idea on. Please, I'd love to hear from you. Again, 646-926-6350. I really do appreciate you listening to this episode of I Can't See You. Show notes available at icantseeyou.com slash 262. That's icantseeyou.com slash 262. And remember, I Can't See You sounds like a whole sentence, but it's only seven characters long. I, C-A-N-T, see you dot com slash 262. Thank you so much. Be well, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the I Can't See You podcast with David. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends.